Good morning, everyone. I appreciate everybody being at our July 28th uh, special called Fiscal Court meeting. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Mass County Fiscal Court will be video conferencing the Fiscal Court meetings live on the Mass County Kentucky Facebook page and on local Spectrum TV channel 377 in compliance with the Office of the Attorney General's opinion 20-05. At this time, I'd like to, to call this meeting to order. Clerk Barger, if you will, please call the roll. Master Combs. He said here. Master Barger. Here. Master Tudor. Here. Here. Master Bakken. Present. Present. Judge Taylor. Here. Our video phase is a little slow this morning. Uh, thank you, Clerk Barger. Appreciate that. At this time, uh, I'll ask everyone, if you will, bow your heads. Uh, let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this wonderful day. Lord, thank you for all the many blessings you give us each and every day. Lord, be with us as we uh, conduct county business this morning in our fiscal court meeting. Lord, just give us open hearts and minds. Uh, let us be a good example to our community as we make decisions on their behalf. Lord, lead, lead God and direct us throughout the rest of this week. Keep us all safe. Lord, be with all those that are struggling in the world today. Uh, and uh, just let them know that that you are the, the ultimate healer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite our sheriff to lead us in pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thanks, Sheriff. Everyone, you've had a chance to look over the minutes from our previous meeting. Uh, at this time, I need a motion and a second to approve. So moved. I have a motion by Larry. Uh, John Tudor? Second. I'll second that motion to approve. Thank you all. Is there any discussion? All right, seeing none, call the roll, please. Mr. Combs? Yes. Mr. Barger? Yes. Mr. Tudor? Yes. Mr. Bakken? Yes. 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 Uh, next, we have uh, Ma our Mass County Treasurer, Glenna Smith, online with us today to give us our Treasurer's report. Good morning, Glenna. Good morning, how are you all? Good. I uh, have the financial statement is in the drop box. And as of June 30th, 2020, uh, we have a total fund balance of $6,033,805.96. To end our fiscal year 19 slash 20, um, our revenues for the general fund was 106.3%. Our expenditures were at 88.5. Our road fund revenues ended with 100.1%. Our expenditures were at 86.7%. Our jail fund revenues ended at 79.4%. Our expenditures are at 90.8%. The LGEA fund, our revenues were at 101.7%. Our expenditures are at zero percent. CSEP fund, our revenues were at fourteen point nine percent. Our expenditures were fourteen point nine percent. Our nine one one fund, our revenues ended with one one hundred and four point one percent. Our expenditures ended at seventy eight point seven percent. Our health fund revenues ended at one hundred and thirteen point one percent. Our expenditures were at sixty six point one percent. The condition report and the revenue condition report and appropriation report is attached. Um, these have not been reconciled yet. I will get a fourth quarter report out to you when it's finished being reconciled. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Glenda, that's really good on our health account, isn't it? Yeah. It sounds yes. good. Um, I have not reconciled up through June 30th yet, so the expenditures will go up just a little bit. Um, but yes, it's, the health count's doing really well. Yeah. yeah, it was a good move. 
So, um, Magistrates, do y'all have any questions at this time on anything for Glenna? No, no. No, no. All right. Thank, thanks, Glenna. Appreciate the report. Um, before we get into our first order of business today, I do just want to let the fiscal court know that number three, we are going to strike that from the agenda today. It's the first reading of ordinance 2019 Mass County COVID uh, FMLA. Uh, we will not be acting on that at this point. So that number three will be stricken from the agenda. Um, the first order of business today is a discussion about our heating and air uh, in the annex building, which is on the corner of West Urban Street and Second Street. Uh, we've uh, been working throughout our construction projects at the courthouse and uh, the move over um, for Kenny Barger over to the clerk's or the clerk's office over to the annex. Uh, and we found some issues with heating and air in the annex building. Um, Bacchus Oliver with Mark Engineering is on with us today. Uh, Bacchus is going to sort of give us an overview of what they found uh, in some of the uh, the 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 drawings and, and uh, study of this building. Uh, and, and I just wanted him to come and to uh, inform the, the fiscal court uh, about this building and uh, some possible changes that we will need to possibly make in the future. Uh, and I just wanted to lay it all out here on the table. So Bacchus, I really appreciate you being here today, being here, being on Zoom today. Sure. Uh, I think from Western Kentucky, Central time zone. That's uh, correct. So uh, appreciate you being on. I'll just turn it over to you now, Bacchus. Okay. Is it okay, Judge, if I uh, share the screen so that uh, the magistrates can see slides? Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. all right. Sure. Let me do this and you all tell me if it works for everyone. Hopefully, you see a slide now with the title Madison County Courthouse Annex. Um, we're, we're not yet, but sometimes there is a little bit of a delay. Um, there you go. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you, Judge, and thank you, Magistrates, for allowing us to be of service to Madison County. Uh, we have completed a uh, assessment of, of your somewhat newer courthouse annex. Um, I think the purpose of the uh, assessment was when we started looking at the annex for a potential uh, temporary courtroom, I started to notice things about the building uh, and some things that were, there were shortages. It was going to become a design uh, issue. And then also I learned of occupant complaints, people that's been in the building. So the purpose of the, the process we used to go in and look deeper into the building, besides just looking at putting uh, either the temporary court there or now we're looking at the county clerk maybe moving there is uh, I did inspect the building visually. We went over all parts of it. We did obtain the drawings and review the drawings and we did obtain uh, three years of utility bills and, uh, and, and analyze your energy bills. So the background of the building, it was constructed in 2005. So it's 15 years old. That's relatively young for a building. Uh, it's 36,000 square feet. It's an all electric facility, which was kind of surprising that we're not using uh, natural gas being that we have natural gas in the city. Um, it's approximately 75% occupied. Uh, I'm not sure the building has ever seen full occupancy yet. It could have, but uh, it's slowly been filling up. Uh, when the county clerk moves in, I believe we'll be at 100% occupied. Uh, the building is four stories tall, yet it's 65 feet high, so it's really tall. Uh, that's usually indicative of government buildings. It's what architects usually do is make sure the government buildings uh, have prominence. The HVAC system that's in the building is a good type. It's a water source heat pump system with a dedicated outside air system. So with that, the first thing we did is we, we uh, did equipment assessments. Uh, first, first piece of equipment was a fluid cooler. This is on the roof. This is what helps provide the cooling necessary for the system. What I noted about the fluid cooler is that it is at the end of its equipment life. 15 years is, is, um, is what we uh, estimate these units can make it. We've made it 15 years. Uh, it's under capacity and it's filed. Those pictures you see to the right and of the calcium buildup 
that tells me that there's a uh, fouling going on so the heat exchange is not complete so i believe we're under capacity just due to the uh, wear and tear and de degradation of the unit uh what's really surprising is the unit is installed in the roof spire uh the roof spire is, is shown on the left picture there and what's not good about this is this hampers the airflow uh, these units have to have uh, copious amounts of airflow and uh, i wouldn't have put it in this spire because that just restricts airflow so i believe that is another reason we are short on cooling at times because it was done this way, this system requires an inefficient secondary loop, which is another heat exchanger, another pump, seven half horsepower, and a filter. Um, I will note by being in Spire that replacement's difficult. So if I was giving this a school grade, this system's getting a D, a D minus maybe. It's something we've got to contend with within a year. The next equipment was the boiler. This is on the uh, lowest level it's all electric so this is a 250 kw boiler uh, it's kind of surprising that a building of this size uses electricity only there is no backup boiler you only have one of these this boiler is very large and is in the electrical room and it encroaches these uh, space required for electrical panels to meet nec and it hampers egress if you'll notice just beyond it above the boiler is a the second exit for the room that's required by code, but you can't get to that door. Um, so um, this building, this boiler is just not enough uh, as far as quantity, not a standby and too big and in the way. Also inefficient being electric. The next item that we, uh, we found something to talk about was a dedicated outside air system. This is located on your roof. We call it DOAS. Uh, what we found out about this unit is it's excessively ventilating. It's bringing in more CFM than is required for the building occupants. It's also under capacity on cooling and dehumidification. It cannot totally cool and dehumidify what it's trying to bring in. So thus, what it's doing is it's adding load to all of our spaces. I believe this unit right here is probably the chief culprit and our comfort complaints. Uh, when it's on and when it's running, it's overwhelming our uh, individual spaces, uh, HVAC units. Other things I noted is the condensate spills right on the roof and runs across the roof. That's degradating our roof. We don't need that. We need to pipe that directly to a roof drain. It's using the older uh, non-environmental environmental friendly R22 refrigerant that is very hard to get now it costs a lot uh, per pound to buy that and to keep the refrigeration system charged and as i said this is the chief culprit of complaints of comfort i believe uh, the next system that i assessed was your hydronic system that is your uh, your uh, hvac water that loops through the building that all units exchange heat with uh, the pumps uh, noted have redundant strainers. In this picture, you'll see there's two types of strainers in series. That's just excessive pressure drop. I would recommend removing one of those. The pumps could be variable for savings. These are constant volume pumps uh, at uh, 10 horsepower running all day long. That's a lot of kilowatts. Uh, these pumps have an inefficient check valve. Uh, you can see it in the photograph there. It's the wrong style to be a low pressure drop. And then in the right picture is a circuit setter. Uh, the characteristics of this type of circuit setter is a large pressure drop. Pressure drops just are energy wasters. They are what you have to have horsepower to overcome to move the water. So I believe there are some improvements that can be made to our pumping system. The next system, or I'm actually continuing on with hydronic systems. Uh, there has been a piping modification in the third floor mechanical room. Uh, you can see it in the picture on the left. It's all the unpainted pipe. I understand this was done a year or two after occupancy of the building. Uh, it was done quickly, I'll say, and not done too well. I would recommend straightening this up and making it uh, more correct. And then the uh, fluid cooler piping was also modified after we moved into the building. Um, 
It requires the pump that you see there in the middle, and it requires the heat exchanger you see on the far right. Both those both of those things are just energy users that I could uh, work around and remove those and not have to have them. We also assessed your HVAC controls, which for this building is is woefully underdone. Uh, the far left picture is just a local thermostat. This is what controls all of your different spaces. Uh, it's independent. Uh, it has no computer integration. Uh, and so basically every space can run as high or low as they want with very little administrative oversight. Uh, and we're not taking advantage of setting back at night or on weekends for energy savings. Uh, then you got lots of control panels. Uh, basically, there's a control panel dedicated to each major equipment function. There's one for the cooling system on the roof. There's one for the DOAS on the roof. There's one for the heating system in the basement. These things are all working on their own and not working together um, collectively for energy management. So this has made it very difficult to service. This has made it very difficult to get temperatures um, uh, set. So I believe this is our second contributor to being uncomfortable is not having the type of controls that we should have for a building that's so large. Uh, our other company, Markham Energy Management Solutions, studied your utility bills. And basically, I want you to take two things away from this. Um, for the last three years, the building has scored an EUI, or that's your energy use intensity, of 78 in 2017, 59 in 2018, 66 in 2019. For an average of the last three years of 66 kilo BTUs a square foot. That kilo BTUs per square foot is an EUI. Uh, it is a unit that engineers assigned to a building to assess how efficient is the building. Uh, just like we say miles per gallons for our automobiles, engineers say, what is the EUI for the building? What this tells me, uh, well, I'm going to get to a, a summary page and we'll discuss what this means. So, but basically, we're benchmarking how the building has been doing on efficiency. Also, uh, I had my engineers do a calculation on what could we expect if we changed the boilers from electric to natural gas. And I've talked to your gas department. And we can install gas on this building, and I would recommend gas for space heating and water heating, and also for the DOAS. Uh, in summary, the bottom right corner tells us that we could have a savings of $11,000 an annual year if we would switch to natural gas. Uh, natural gas costs less per therm than electricity is the reason for the, uh, the difference there. Uh, this is why I was surprised to find the building was all electric. So I'm going to kind of summarize performance uh, summary. Our cooling systems is poor. The fluid cooler is undersized. The DOAS system is undersized. Uh, it's also oversized on air, but it's undersized on being able to cool and dehumidify, and that's allowing humidity into the into the building. And then we got a first floor. Uh, County clerk may move into the first floor later, uh, and that area is undersized to support the county clerk office. Heating is fair, but it's all electric, and we only have one boiler. If that one boiler goes down, we're kind of in an emergency state. Uh, you got to have heating. You can get by without having cooling, but you got to have heat so that you don't freeze uh, a building and, and burst systems. Ventilation is poor. The DOAS air delivery is oversized. Also, it's consuming more energy than necessary because it's oversized. And then on HVAC controls, it's poor. It's not centralized. It's inaccessible by a computer. And it's not employing energy management, generally done for buildings of this size. So uh, in my opinion, we, we're doing poor, fair, poor, and poor. So it's not really good news there. Um, I kind of knew this was true. This was the reason that Judge Taylor and I decided we needed to do an assessment and report to you all. The last performance is energy consumption. Energy consumption, I say, was fair. Uh, the median uh, energy use for a office building in America is 53. The lower the score, the more efficient. 
we have an average of 66. So the, what you can see in that is we could be doing better trying to get down to the median. Uh, we have a relatively new building. It should be doing better than this. Uh, it's a new building built with the newer technologies, built with better insulations that are required. And so I feel like there's some energy savings that could be had. And so I tried to structure a project to try to improve our EUI for the building. Uh, one thing I would recommend, recommend is we should consider using natural gas for space heating, water heating, and also for the uh, ventilation air that's on the roof. Also, we can study more of your utility bills if you'd like. Our uh, other company will review utility bills and structures and can meet with your utility companies and look for possible savings. Uh, we did note that your electrical uh, rate structure is very complicated. Uh, and for that reason, you're not gonna be able to get full maximum savings just because of the way it is calculated and the minimum that you all are expected to use electrically. It should be looked at to see if there's a potential to have that rate structure readdressed. So, I turned all that information into what I hope is a short list for you of what I call the needs and probable costs for the building. I'm going to describe the need and then I'm going to give you an earmark cost. This isn't a quote. Uh, this wasn't a uh, something that I ran by a contractor. This is, in my opinion, the probably amount we need to allot for this repair measure. First one, and this is in order of importance, the very first thing I would do is we do need to enhance our fluid cooler. I would recommend removing the entire system. The roof piping has been problematic, the fluid cooler that's in the, uh, that's in the, uh, the spire. Uh, I would remove the heat exchanger and the pump that's in the room below it. I would specify a different fluid cooler that has an ASME coil to replace the heat exchanger. I would increase the capacity of this unit I would locate the unit on the roof in the middle of the building. I would not put it in the building spire again. This unit needs to be off into itself and allowed to free draw air. And there would be roof modifications required to uh, support this load out in the middle of the building. Uh, for this entire task, I uh, basically put an earmark of $150,000 for that change, but we will improve all of it when we make the move. In the end, it will save you energy over the other, and it's also getting rid of something that's at the end of its equipment life. <clears throat> boiler system. I recommend removing the uh, large electric boiler and installing two natural gas boilers, each of them sized at 65% of the needed load. The reason for this is if we lose one boiler, the second one could basically get us by mild weather and it can get us by an emergency situation. While it's not a full 100%, engineers generally size them at 65% so that we're getting by. But I would have a primary boiler, a second boiler that comes on on the coldest of days, and then a second boiler that's standing there ready for uh, failure of the first. The boilers will be smaller and they would be located against the wall, improving the egress and getting out of the NEC space requirements for the electrical panels. We'd also improve the boiler room to be smoke tight. And uh, this would require a gas meter installation and talking to the gas company, the best location we found for it was on the side of the building, the corner closest to the courthouse. And it, the meter would actually face our county detention center. So it'd be right along the sidewalk facing the detention center. To do this improvement to the boiler system is 122,000. Third, I would correct the DOAS unit on the roof. I would remove the existing unit. I would install a more modern, more efficient, and a right sized unit. I would correct the capacity of the unit, moving less air and providing more cooling. I would change the unit to not be on the water system anymore, but I would change it to be an air cooled machine and using the natural gas that's on the building. So I'd be running a gas line up to the roof to allow it to have the, the heat ability. We would have then an environmentally friendly refrigerant that's cheaper to uh, recharge. And the, uh, anyway, I've already talked about the gas pipe. So the earmark for this would be $92,000 for correcting DOAS. Remember, this is the unit 
that I believe is causing the biggest problems to comfort. Next in order of rank, I would install DDC controls. Uh, that's, a, that's basically a digital control system. I would remove everything that's there. I would install a facility-wide digital control system. It would be replacing all thermostats, all the panels um, with controllers. This would be a, a computerized control system that's web accessible and that will email or text notifications when there's a problem. And that helps maintenance know that they need to go and investigate something before it becomes an even bigger problem. Uh, we can program this unit for what's now popular and that is a virus mode. Um, and we can even look at putting uh, ultraviolet light in the unit to help um, uh, make the air safer for the occupants of the room uh, of the building. And then uh, last thing is we can most importantly, we can program for energy savings. We would have an unoccupied mode. We'd have temperature resets for mild days. <coughs> There's many things we can do to improve the efficiency of the building if we had a computerized control system. Uh, these aren't cheap. You'll see that that's $74,000 to go in there and integrate all that in and program it. Next, uh, I would modify the hydronic system. I would remove the excessive, I would remove the components causing excessive pressure loss. I would install variable frequency drives on the pumps and slow them down to only pump only as much as needed. This means I would install control valves on all your HVAC units throughout the building. Uh, those control valves are needed to shut off water to them when, when it's not needed. That's what allows the pump to be able to be slowed down. I would improve the plumbing on the third floor mechanical room, and I would correct the freeze potential of the roof mount of piping. Um, I don't think we faced that the last couple of years, but it has been a problem in the past. All in all, this would be $82,000, uh, just one whole number for that improvement. Uh, this is something that's optional. I uh, would consider replacing your electric water heater on the ground level. It's a 27 KD, kW water heater. Now that you would have natural gas in the building, you could easily change that to a gas water heater. Uh, and we would have to install gas piping just a little differently and over to that area. That would be $18,000 to make that improvement. That will produce an energy savings. Uh, the ROI on this, I don't know, but it, it does have uh, some savings. You could perhaps wait till the water heater is bad and when you replace it, just change the gas then. So here's a summary page and I am, I am done. Uh, I know this has been a dry topic for you, but I put it all on one page so you can see it in front of you. Uh, I've described the improvements that are necessary and I've just and I'm going to basically create a column for the things <coughs> optional. I believe the fluid cooler is necessary. It's at end of life. Uh, it's going to be a problem for us. It's going to be an emergency for us in a couple of years. We just don't know when that could occur. The boiler system, uh, I believe, is necessary. That's, there's some code violations in the basement. We don't have backup for emergency, uh, and we could be saving money if we was using natural gas for heating. The DOAS unit's creating a big problem. The DDC controls are needed to maximize energy savings. So you can see what that would total for the building of items that I describe as necessary. Optional systems would be the hydronic improvements and the water heater. And they've got a total there that you should see of 100,000. So apart from the boiler system, the recommendations identified uh, should be done uh, should be installed January through April of next year. We need to be putting this in uh, when the heating system is in operation and the cooling system is shut down. Uh, we need to do this ahead of the next cooling season because we may not make it through the next cooling season if we move the county clerk in and if we start having troubles with the fluid cooler. If you want to do the work in January through April of next year, then bidding should begin this year uh, we should start the bid process on September 1, opening bids late September, hopefully in a contract in October, so the materials could be ordered, planning could be getting uh, complete so that we're ready to go come January uh, when we can take the cooling system down. 
to do that, to be able to bid uh, in the month of September, design should begin uh, immediately. So I think what's before you is you're at the time, unfortunately, to have to make a decision now for the next coming year, or you can put it off and everything has to move one year because you cannot change a cooling system with the building occupied in the, uh, in the summer months. With that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. I hope it covered things pretty well, but I will be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Bacchus. Um, I will state that since I've been in office, since we, as this court has been here together, you know, we have had a lot of issues in this building. Um, we've had a lot of heat and air, heat, uh, cooling issues. Uh, we used to have to drain the cooling tower um, because of it freezing. Um, Donna is very, she's been here pretty much since this building's been new. Uh, she's told me stories of things that weren't done correctly. Uh, when when the building was being built and has caused problems ever since. So, um, magistrates, do y'all have any questions? Um, <clears throat> do y'all have any questions or comments or any discussion at this time? Go ahead, go ahead, John. Yes, Judge. Uh, do we know? Uh, sorry, John, hold on. Just uh, back us if you don't mind. If you don't, if you if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and take your screen down. Okay. Uh, in that way that we we can see everybody. Yeah, there we go. Go ahead, John. Judge, do we know who installed the heat and air in the original uh, construction of the building? I, I do not. Um, I, I do not, no. It was, uh, I think, in 05. So, Bacchus, I don't know if you know that or not. But. I I don't know. I do know you uh, I do know the building was built by construction manager, I believe. So it could have been on multiple. The construction manager method allows the use of many options on uh, on contractors. But I will note there's 15 years and generally a statute of limitations for buildings and systems and construction is, is seven and a half. Larry, uh, if you don't care to unmute, if you're saying something. Yeah, I think, you know, hit it again, Larry. No, one more time, hit mute again. All right, you're good, okay. right there. Bacchus, is there any one or two things that we could do, say, as of now, that would buy us a little more time instead of having to come up with all that money at one time? Uh, yeah, if I was to take that necessary column and say critical and then necessary critical is the fluid cooler and the DOAS unit, uh, and the controls to control those things. So that would remove 122,000 from the 438. So that gives you a new total. The critical items I think are 316,000. Uh, I still think the boiler is necessary, but it could be put off uh, because of uh, financial means, and then the optional could just be put off. Oh, well, that was just a question. Yep. No, that's good. It's a good question, Larry. Uh, one of the things that I do want to also um, work with Bacchus on is looking at what the actual energy savings actually is. Uh, I know we do uh, spend a lot of money, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bacchus, but our water bill here is pretty high due to the fact of that cooling tower and how much water it uses. Yes, I understand that you're having to use a cooling tower. I understand you're having to use domestic water to uh, overcome the fouling and the underside. Uh, the problem is the fluid coolers in the spire. <laughs> And so you are all having to use city water to cool the system down to do that. If you put in a new fluid cooler, that will stop. Is there any other comments or Roger, Tom? Well, I saw judge that it looked like there was in one of the first slides, a potential for an $11,000 savings. 
correct. So I think that, um, you know, I would, I would sort of, um, and, and I'm assuming that that savings is, is um, encompassed by the replacement of everything that's on there, right? I appreciate you asking, Magistrate. Actually, no, that was for the uh, changing the changing the boiler system to natural gas heat. So what it indicates if the boiler system costs one hundred twenty-two thousand and eleven thousand dollar annual savings, your return on investment is about ten years. Uh, if you continue using the building the way you have the past three years, uh, that all can change on how much energy you use. Yeah, there, there would be uh, my understanding of this, and back is correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of this, when we when we change out all these different components to gas, that there be more there be more savings. I mean, the water bills, uh, the electric bills of it all would be a greater savings than than the eleven thousand that you're referring to, Tom. Sure. Uh, I'd like to add that eleven thousand is the biggest. Uh, Domestic water heating is very small compared to space heating. Uh, the DOS heat would be uh, small as well. So that 11,000 is the big chunk. The other ones will be a, a thousand or a couple thousand a year too. They will add to it. And I'm sure on the water usage, uh, when you're buying domestic, you know, when you're buying domestic water, you're paying on sewer as well. Uh, That's correct. And, and so, uh, I'm sure that would be a pretty good savings as well. But I, I would like to look into that just to see what <coughs> the return on investment is. And, and I'm assuming, Tom, it's kind of probably where you're going with it is, is that if we can see savings uh, that potentially pays, uh, you know, a loan or a, a, a bond payment over a period of time, then, you know, it's really a smart decision. With a uh, boiler system, a new replacement on it, I think we said earlier too that it's a 15 year is about the life cycle on those. Was that correct? No, the uh, 15 year life cycle is for a fluid cooler. Uh, the boiler should last uh, 50 year, uh, 30 years. 30 years, okay. Yep. Unfortunately, the electric boiler is still functional. We'd be taking something out that's functional, but we'd be doing it in order to get a payback in 10 years of some savings. Uh, Judge, I will say I did look at your water sewer savings and it's impossible to quantify how much you've all been using. Uh, and talking with Donna, uh, we've not been recording how much we're using. We don't have a meter on it. And so it's just unknown what the turnout will be after we stop doing that or stop using it. So I wasn't able to report to you all today uh, what that dollar savings <coughs> would be. Bacchus, is that turned off in the wintertime when, when it gets the cold season, or does that continue to run all year? It pretty much is only being used in your hot summer months. Uh, you're not needing it at all in the winter. Uh, so it probably, I imagine it starts having to be added somewhere about um, June, and it'll probably go to uh, late September being used. And, okay. And I don't know if everybody understands this, but just imagine your water in your home. But what you're having to do is you're having to turn on water, put it in, and turn on a drain valve and let it run out. So we call it uh, pump and dump. We're putting water in and we're dumping water out simultaneous. That's just like an open spigot on your home. So it would pain you to sit there and have to w watch that and know that that's going on. But that's what that's what we've been having to do to keep the system functioning for the <coughs> administration of the county. Uh, Roger, uh, the money issue, I know is on our side of it to determine how we're going to do it, but I got a concern also with, uh, getting the parts. I know that most companies are running way behind on getting parts to people when they need them. So, uh, on his end, as far as Bacchus is concerned, I wonder if, if he's having any problems with the jobs that he's been on about a delay of parts because of the. The, the lack of workers to build. And are you referring to Roger, like if we had to fix something on this building that's already existing? No, I'm talking about the parts that be bringing in to, to redo what we're talking about doing. Okay. All right. So that's, 
I've built that into the schedule on the last page. The reason I want to, the reason I'm recommending you all bid in the month of September is so that there's an extra month of getting materials. Uh, you're right, uh, Magistrate. Um, there for a while, we were having a hard time getting things because plants were shut down. Most plants have opened now and they're back to producing. So I did add a contingency of time, uh, not knowing what's going to happen later this year, but that is correct. We have dealt with that problem. Some things are still behind, but a lot of things have caught up. Thank you, Roger. John, John, you wanted to talk, go ahead. I just wanted to ask Bacchus, uh, looking back at the energy use for 2017, 18 and 19, why is there such a difference in uh, 2018, we had 59 units and in, in 2019, 66. Is it the weather had something to do with that or the usage? Uh, absolutely. Uh, everything goes into that number. Uh, it depends what you got the thermostat set at. It depends what the weather was that year. Uh, it also depends on uh, loading up the building. I understand that we've been slowly adding uh, people to the building. And so people produce heat. And so that helps. So uh, I think it's all those factors. 17 was probably a colder year on average than 18 and 19. And I think we were slowly getting the building up to 100% full capacity. So with your recommendations, you feel like we can get in the 50s somewhere with the usage? Ideally, I want to get you in the 40s. And then in case I miss my mark, we'll be in the 50s. But I shoot high on this stuff to make sure we get a lot of savings. Uh, these systems we're talking about are some of your biggest system user, energy users in your in your building. And so we're we're controlling the big the big rocks on the wall and we're not worried about the little rocks on the wall. And so by getting a hold of these and by getting a control system that Donna can schedule and, and manage all the different suites temperatures, we can really start to get chokehold on something that's really running wild right now. And wild by wild we mean it's running unchecked. Yeah, if you think about that, you know, m m the majority of the people in the building are here, you know, eight to five. Mm -hmm. um, and so from five to eight, uh, you know, you, you could you could have these electronic controls set to where, you know, it, it uh, it's, the units aren't running. Right. Uh, for an office, only 38% of the day <laughs> it's occupied. So you got you got all that other time that you need to be setting back and saving energy. So the eleven thousand dollars is on the savings on the changing the boiler out to gas. That's not uh, adding the other savings with the other improvements we'll have there. That's correct. Um, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I did not. In this assessment, I did not have a calculations for all total savings, but I did in reviewing the boiler look at just what switching to natural gas could do for us. Yep. There'll be more savings than that. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Kenny. Um, I know when we were talking about uh, plans and us moving over there, there's a couple of things that I didn't hear mentioned. One was that fluid cooler in the spire is custom made. Don't go grab that off the shelf. What Roger's point was about getting parts. If that goes down, we're out of business in that building cooling until we get one custom made. So that, in my opinion, that thing has to come out of there and be replaced. And custom made is awful, also more expensive. And the second thing is the addition of the water to keep the fluid cooler going. Uh, you're running a pump 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the summertime. So it's not just the cost of the water, it's the cost of electricity too. Those, those savings are unknown, basically. You can't calculate those savings. So we're just, what he's giving you on ROI is just the, the tip of the iceberg on what can what could be done. And then the rerouting of that piping, the variable pumps, it's it's a huge savings uh, over just a year's time. Yeah, thank, thank you, Kenny. Yeah, you bring up a good point. I, you know, some of the backstory on that, the cooling tower uh, that's up there in that spire that, uh, that the spire was actually built uh, and that cooling tower was actually not the one that was designed because they built the spire and then tried to set the cooling tower and it wouldn't fit. Um, so that's some of the backstory when they built the building. Uh, 
So what, what would be the pleasure of the court in this situation of moving forward? I mean, you, you I think, uh, Bacchus, we really appreciate uh, your in-depth conversation here and uh, educating us on our building. Um, what would be the pleasure of the court <coughs> moving forward? Do we, do we want to go back and try to calculate some of those numbers to see if we can uh, identify some of the savings? Uh, John, sorry, I didn't see your hand up, buddy. That's okay. Judge, uh, I appreciate backups and the market engineering forgiveness this analysis, but do we need to get another analysis before we move forward? I'm sure that's probably going to be similar, but it's always good to compare different quotes on different uh, estimates, you know. Uh, is, is that something we need to look into before we move forward? Well, typically, John, when typically with this, Bacchus is an engineering firm, uh, and so they they are the ones that are the engineers that have the stamp and the approval to know uh, what um, what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done. And then then we would bid it out as far as actually who's going to perform the work to like a, a HVAC contracting company. Um, I mean, if, if, if it's the pleasure of the court to get another engineering firm to choose one to, to, to go through a design process, um, uh, if that's the pleasure of the group, I'd have to look into that. Um, typically, when you hire your engineer, engineers and your architects, you know, they are the professionals that are working for us. Um, it's who we hire to work for us to make sure that we're getting the best deal and make sure that it's fixed correctly. Yeah, uh, I would add to that, Judge, that uh, when you look at the fees for an architect engineer, they're they're less than 10% of your total work. Where we bring your, our values, we produce concise drawings and specs to get competitive bidding on that 90% of it or 95% of it. So the savings is made in the construction uh, trade. Um, uh, and also, I guess the reason we're involved is we are the engineers working on your uh, future courthouse renovation. And so we were there and familiar with the building and we were able to produce a report much quicker. Um, I would say that if you want to get another opinion, you you'd probably need to plan for putting this off to work in 2022. Tom Bakken. Hey, Judge, I, I don't think that it's a question about whether or not we need it or not. It looks like it's pretty obvious that we need it. The question just simply going to be is how we're going to pay for it. You know, where, where are you going to get uh, half a million dollars at? I think that's the that's the point and the part that we'd have to take a step back and look at and see where our funding is going to come from. So what it, is what I'm hearing, um, you all would like, the pleasure of the court would be for me to work with Glenna, uh, maybe work with Bacchus as well to try to uh, figure out what our energy savings are um, and to see how that we could accommodate uh, getting this done. That's what I would think. And then, and then we also might look at phasing it, um, you know, maybe doing the most critical things first and sort of maybe making a, uh, we'll work with Bacchus on maybe making a three year phase in or something like that to see, you know, if we can ultimately reach our goal of having a more efficient building, and a better system and phase it over three years or so. Yeah. I would think that makes sense. I'd be in favor of that, Judge. Okay. All right. Well, that's the direction that uh, I will go in. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the discussion. Uh, Bacchus, I uh, really appreciate all you've done with uh, Markham Engineering. So thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you all, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Thank you all very much. You see, moving on, first reading of Ordinance 2018. This is the Bluegrass Regional Radio Network Interlocal Agreement. And I believe we have our very own Chris Israel. Thanks, Judge. Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, you're probably going, didn't we already do this? Uh, we already did, but there were some substantial changes that took place once this got to Scott County and Georgetown um, that requires us to readopt this. So in front of you that was in Dropbox is uh, the new ordinance that 
uh, makes those changes. So I'll just read the top of this. It says an ordinance to Mass County Fiscal Court, Scott County Fiscal Court, City of Georgetown and the University of Kentucky to adopt an interlocal agreement for the creation of the Bluegrass Regional Radio Network and repeal ordinance 20-16. Uh, the substantive changes were basically that uh, the City of Georgetown and Scott County requested that the ordinance um, contain the information about what each entity is providing uh, because that is basically how the dividends were defined. So we went ahead and explained those inside that ordinance. And then we also made a change to the dividends. And let me get to that page. It is now a 10 page document. Um, the dividends are now 26% Madison County Fiscal Court, 26% University of Kentucky, and the city of Georgetown and Scott County will have a combined 8% dividend. So those are the substantial changes that were made to the ordinance. Um, that is the reason that we have to bring this back for your approval. Any questions? You're muted, Reagan. Sorry, thank you, Chris. Uh, at this time, do I have a motion and a second for ordinance 2018, Tom? Oh, yeah. Judge, I'd like to make a motion to, to approve uh, Ordinance 2018. Roger. Second. I have a motion and a second. Okay. Now, now discussion. Um, Tom? Hey, uh, Chris, on, uh, on, uh, at the bottom of page one, uh, it's mm -hmm. talking about the uh, investments uh, by Madison County Physical Court be approximately $5 million in communications infrastructure. Are we talking about infrastructure that's already in place? That is infrastructure that is coming with the building of the BRN that is paid for by the CSEP program and the radio project. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. All right. Any other discussion? Is there any other questions? <coughs> John, did you have your hand up? I did not uh, okay. judge, but if I will make a comment there, uh, uh, sure. any technology or uh, improvements we can get paid for by uh, CSEF while they're still here, uh, we need to go ahead and do that because we won't be able to afford it once they're gone, Judge. Yeah. And, and John, I I'm, I'm appreciate you bringing that up. You know, a, a lot of this right now is that we're starting to form partnerships to help us post CSEF financially. Uh, to be able to have a broader region of support, other counties, saving us money, saving them money, saving, at the end of the day, we're saving taxpayers money, uh, which is which is what we need to, that's why we're here, uh, to be as efficient as possible to save taxpayer dollars. So um, I, I think this is a good start. I really appreciate uh, Chris and Dustin and Colleen uh, for working with uh, uh, UK's, um, law enforcement with University of Kentucky, uh, working with uh, Judge Joe Pat Covington, uh, Scott County Judge Executive and the Mayor of Georgetown. Uh, I, th I think that this is really gonna be uh, good for, for our region. So, any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, call the roll please. Master Tudor. Hey, uh, John, go ahead and unmute so we can hear you say yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Barker? Yes. Mr. Combs? Yes. Mr. Barker? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Uh, and I do, I do want to make an announcement uh, that our, this is a first reading. Uh, we will have a scheduled second reading in our next fiscal court meeting, which will be on August the 11th. Uh, and at the con or, uh, for any citizen that would like to make public comment, feel free to email the comment to comments at madisoncountyky.us uh, and a copy of this ordinance uh, will be available on our website at www.madisoncountyky.us under the transparency tab. Uh, any, anybody that's even interested in, and doesn't quite catch that, feel free to call my office uh, and we'll walk you through how to make sure that, uh, that your comments are heard. Uh, next, we have a first reading of ordinance 2020. Uh, this is a zone change for 3241, 3245, and 3249 Old Kentucky Highway 52. 
Uh, yep. Good morning, Bert. There you are. I appreciate you being on today. You all should have a uh, copy of the Planning Commission's recommendation notes um, in your packet. Um, this is the first reading, so I'll go ahead and read the ordinance. Uh, ordinance number 20-20 and ordinance of the Madison County Post of Fort Kentucky. The of change of 3241, 3245, and 3249, Old Kentucky Highway 52, Richmond, Richmond, Kentucky, and authorizing the amendment of the official zoning map of Madison County, Kentucky. Whereas the here and after described land is located in Madison County, Kentucky, and whereas the Madison County Planning Commission held a public hearing on Tuesday, July 21st, 2020, to consider a land use change request from application from RC7, which is Rural Corridor Agriculture, to RC1, which is Rural Corridor Single Family Residential. Upon presentation by the applicant and with a single email read into the record in opposition to the application, findings of fact were made by the Planning Commission as described in their summary of evidence, findings of fact, and recommendations of the fiscal court attached here too, and made a part hereof for all purposes as follows. That the existing zoning classification is inappropriate and the proposed zoning classification is appropriate for the following reasons. Character and area of the property due to the residential development in the rural corridor and the size and location of this track make RC7 a non-viable use of this property. The character of the surrounding area and this property are more suitable for residential purposes as, sub as the subject property is within the rural corridor and surrounded and in close proximity to other properties used for residential purposes. It contains the required infrastructure for residential development. Whereas the Madison County Planning Commission upon hearing testimony made a motion with unanimous consent to recommend to the Madison County Fiscal Court to approve the land use change request from RC7 to RC1. And whereas the Madison County Fiscal Court has reviewed said findings and recommendations of the Madison County Planning Commission and being otherwise sufficiently advised and does hereby adopt the findings of fact made thereby. Now, therefore, it be ordained and enacted by the Fiscal Court of Madison of the County of Madison, Commonwealth of Kentucky, that the land use classification of the following described property be changed by this ordinance from RC7 to RC1 classification. There's a legal description of the property in Section 1. Section 2, that the Madison County GIS coordinator make the appropriate changes to the official zoning map of Madison County, Kentucky. And Section 3, that the county clerk calls this ordinance to be published in accordance with the Kentucky Revised Statutes. Thank you, Bert. Uh, at this time, do I have a motion and a second uh, for the first reading of ordinance number 2020? Tom? Motion to approve ordinance 2020, uh, Judge. Do I have a second? Roger. Second. I have a motion and a second. Now, is there any discussion? John? Uh, Bert, is this three different addresses? You had three different numbers there. It is three different addresses. It's actually, it's actually three separate tracts of land, one owner. They're all contiguous right next to each other. Why is it submitted as three tracks instead of just one track? That's just the way the property is laid out right now. That's what the, the plat shows for the property. That'll be changed, obviously, if, the, if they ever try to develop it. Okay. It, that's just the existing uh, way the property is laid out. I think between now and the second reading, we'll have a chance to kind of investigate a little bit and see uh, the play of the property and, and look into the uh, needs and uh, of the community out there and see what our uh, decision needs to be. So thank you for bringing it up, Bert. Thanks, John. Roger? Uh, John pretty much answered the question for me, but I was curious to the the property numbers, are they all along 52 or some of them away yeah. from the road? All three of these tracks from 52. Okay. okay. That's all I have. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. Seeing none, call the roll, please. Master Bakken? Yes. Master Combs? Yes. Master Barger? Yes. Master Tudor? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Uh, and I'm going to read this again. This is another first reading. Um, and so we will have our second reading at our next fiscal court meeting. Uh, will you verify, Chris, that that is the 11th, please, real quick? Uh, I don't want to misspeak. I'm pretty sure that the second Tuesday is the 11th. 
of August. Yes. All right. Sorry about that. I wanted to make sure I wasn't giving a wrong date. But our next fiscal court meeting will be August the 11th at 9.30. Uh, for any citizen that would like to make public comment, please feel free to email the comment to comments at madisoncountyky.us. A copy of this ordinance will be available on our website at www.madisoncountyky.us under the transparency tab. Uh, and again, feel free to call my office uh, if you have any questions or concerns or want to understand better how to send your comments. Uh, our office number is 859-624-4700, extension three. Uh, next on our agenda is resolution 2082. It's a safety city uh, MOA. And it looks like we have our chief on today. Good morning, chief. Good morning, how are you? And we also have Lloyd Jordison, Mass County Health Department. Hi, hi Lloyd, how are you, buddy? Hello, we're doing good here. Good. Uh, Chief, do you want to read the resolution? Yes, sir, I agree. <coughs> a resolution to approve a memorandum of agreement between Mass County Physical Court and Mass County Health Department. Whereas Mass County Physical Court and Mass County Health Department desire to enter into this memorandum of agreement to coordinate safety city program and partner programs in collaboration with the Mass County Fire Department and other community partners in order to take a lead role in the operation of safety education training programs at the facility. And whereas Mass County Physical Court agrees to maintain the safety city property and keep it in good repair and to furnish utilities, insurance, janitorial maintenance services, phone, computer, and internet connectivity for the facility. And whereas the Mass County Health Department agrees that Mass County Health Park community health education staff will use the office for scheduled classes and other activities as needed. And whereas no payments shall be made by either party under the terms of this agreement, and whereas the duration of this agreement shall be for a period of one year from the date signed or until terminated by a participating party on 30 days written notice. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the fiscal court does hereby approve to enter this agreement and authorizes the county judge to execute the same on behalf of the county. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion and a second to approve resolution 2082? John Tudor? I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution 2082, Safety City uh, Continuation Upkeep. Thank you, John. Roger? Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? I will say, guys, that this is something that we do every year. Uh, you know, we do have this partnership, uh, which is much appreciated with the health department. Uh, and uh, I know Chief and our fire team and Lloyd and his team at the health department work close together. Uh, it's probably been a little bit of a slow spring and summer uh, due to the due the times that we're in with this virus. Um, but Lloyd, I don't know if you have any kind of updates or any last year's statistics of how many kids and people that we reached before COVID hit. We, we, uh, yeah, we had at least 350 in the fall that came through as far as school children and such. Um, we also have initiated some things post COVID. Um, we are using the, uh, classroom to we've reestablished and restarted our stop the bleed classes uh we do it in a very safe uh covid friendly you know all the precautions are there and we could do up to eight people at a time and we've already had some classes so we've like everybody else we're adapting to see how we can do that we also have plans made um for the future where um, we're looking to do some video stuff we've talked with the schools we talked to the madison county fire department um and I think I've got some funding to be able to do some videos. We're hoping to actually do some videos out at Safety City here in the near future with our first responders doing the education that the schools can then use. Um, it'd be like a YouTube thing where they, the teachers and such could do that kind of education since there's not going to be uh, in-person classes out there from the schools. We're going to try and create some that they can use for their classes. Uh, you know, on however they're doing their at-home uh, lessons, or even if they're in person in their classrooms. Thank you, Lloyd. John. Judge, I'd just like to say, I know with the COVID-19 going on, it's it's been hard to utilize that facility out there, but it sounds like Lloyd 
is making ways to do that. But in the past, uh, Chief Gray with the fire department and the law enforcement and the health department all worked together out there as a training tool to help educate our young people. And I think this is, is great for the community. If, if we can run several hundred through that facility out there a year and make them feel safer at home, at school and wherever they are, I think it's something that's worthwhile, Judge. I agree, John. Anybody else? Any other comments? Uh, this is Lloyd again, and, and Chief, I don't know if you want to put in one of the things, too, that's worked really well is that that facility has also been, you know, the, the chief is using it for his training of new uh, firefighters and such like that. And that's adapted really well. And, and how that building's being used has actually ended up serving well for that classroom, has served well for the, the plans that we're doing now with the uh, Stop the Bleed and being able to use the classroom, that, using it that way. So I appreciate working with the Madison County Fire Department tremendously. Appreciate working with you, Lloyd, also. All right. Anybody else? All right. Seeing none, call the roll, please. Mr. Combs? Yes. Master Barger? Yes. Master Tudor? Yes. Master Bakken? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Thank you all very much. Moving on to our judges' report. Just have a few announcements. Uh, per the governor's mandate, everyone should be wearing a mask or other type of face covering in public until at least mid-August. As everyone knows, the state has experienced uh, a spike in COVID-19 cases and wearing a mask or other type of face coverings is one of the best ways to protect yourself and others from this virus. A good hand washing is also an excellent way to slow down uh, the, the virus progress. Uh, I do, I do, uh, you know, we have had a, a spike in cases in Madison. Uh, we continue to have our weekly COVID task force meeting with a lot of our community leaders. Uh, we did run a report of our cases a few weeks ago, and it was very interesting to see the, the age demographics of those cases and the breakdown uh, that 35%, which is the biggest percentage uh, of the of our of our age group was from the ages of 20 to 29 that had tested positive of our cases. Um, so 20 to 29 year olds were 30 it was a little better than 35 percent of the number of cases that we've had in Madison County. Um, and so, well, the way I looked at that was was that you know the, that age group may be trying to live more of the same type of life that they lived prior to COVID. Um, and so any kind of encouragement that we can give to, uh, you know, our younger generations to, you know, just be compliant with those CDC guidelines, I think uh, the better off we'll be in our community. Uh, our, our older population, uh, 60 and over was only 15% of our total number of cases. Uh, and so I think it sort of speaks speaks for itself. Uh, and I'm thankful because that age group is the more vulnerable um, to, to this virus, uh, according to our medical experts. So uh, I'm very thankful. Uh, but let's just continue to do a good job here in Madison County and be good examples. Uh, the Richmond Chamber of Commerce's annual Pops in the Park has been canceled uh, for 2020. Uh, their committee is already working on how to make the next event even better. Uh, I think our very own county attorney is one of the co-chairs of that event. I'm sorry uh, that we didn't get to have it this year, but I am looking forward to it next year. Um, the 39th annual Business on the Greens Golf Tournament, sponsored by the Richmond Chamber of Commerce, is scheduled for Monday, August the 31st at Arlington Country Club. Now's the time to be getting your team together. You can register and get updates by visiting Richmond Chamber of Commerce's website uh, and their Facebook page. Uh, also, Bria's Farmer's Market is open Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, it's located at 416 Chestnut Street on the little grassy area by the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, today, a few vendors are offering uh, baked goods uh, and sweets, eggs, cheeses, cut herbs, as well as outdoor plants and tomato plants. Uh, they are following strict COVID-19 guidelines. The 2020 Walk to End Alzheimer's uh, will not have an in-person walk gathering this year. However, participants can walk on their own with their families or with their team. Uh, aspects of the, 
event will be broadcast online. Uh, so you are encouraged to download the Walk to End Alzheimer's mobile app in order to enjoy the full walk day experience right from your iPhone or from your phone. Uh, this app is free and accessible on iPhones and Androids. Uh, that's all of my report today. Uh, comments from magistrates. Uh, Tom? Hey, um, Judge, I want to just start out uh, this morning by uh, doing something we do, but we don't do enough of. And that's just giving some kudos to our department heads. Um, last week, I was riding around in the district, and um, I ran into a fellow that was needing some help with getting a tree removed. And I made a couple of phone calls and I passed that on to uh, Willie. And, uh, you know, that's being handled. And, um, you know, that's just a example of one thing that he down at the road department does all the time. You know, I see him all the time. He meets with me. We need something we need to look at. He comes out and takes a look at it. And, uh, of course, you know, they need to pass that on to their men. But they just do an exceptional job for us, and I appreciate that. I also had a, a issue where, um, um, and it's a system thing, where that there was some problem with some burning in the county. And I think maybe you and I even talked about it just a little bit. But. I made a phone call to uh, Chief Gray, and uh, he gave us the uh, information and the procedure to follow uh, for that. If somebody had a complaint about things like that and procedures were followed, then that issue also was resolved. So, you know, I, I appreciate the chief out there, uh, you know, passing good information to us. I appreciate the uh, fact that when somebody tries to use those systems, that in fact, that they dedicate the people to make sure that it goes out and it does work. And um, so that's all of our department heads, you know, the sheriff, the, all of them, the jailer, they've all got tough jobs, but they're all responsive to things that the, that our citizens need. And we certainly appreciate that. Also, just want to remind everybody that, uh, you know, I've been in some of the subdivisions and I noticed that there's vacant lots that are grown up. And, uh, you know, we talk about it every single year, but if you have a lot in a subdivision and you're the owner of that, you still have the responsibility of maintaining that lot. So, you know, you need to go by, if you need to get somebody to uh, bush hog it so you can mow it, then please do so. You know, there's just a lot of things that, that goes on with that that needs to be taken care of. The uh, planning and zoning, I stopped up there the other day, and uh, I want to thank the girls up there for being responsive to uh, a complaint um, for uh, the, a nuisance, which was a yard, it was knee high. And, uh, you know, you get complicated, Judge. We've talked about this in the past whenever that, uh, especially if it's a case where a property has been abandoned and it's an out-of-state um, bank or a mortgage company or something like that that owns it, then things get complicated. But, you know, they're still making the phone calls every day and they're doing the things that they need to do to make sure that those properties are maintained and we hope that gets rectified soon. Uh, we have made some phone calls um, and and with the, out to the state about the grass mowing. And um, they are, you know, I've seen around in the fourth district in places where that there's some things that there's a lot of areas that still need it. Uh, 595 needs it. Uh, on the uh, Menlis Road or Cal East, both of those, you know, are some areas that still need it. And I'm sure that they're working a pattern to get to those. I know, uh, I think last week or maybe the week before they was over in Rogers district not surprising, Tate's Creek's a busy road and it needed the attention over there. But, you know, we have others that also need it too. They just try to hang in there and be patient. They'll get to them just as soon as they can. They're still short staffed over there. Um, the uh, Hinkle projects that we had on uh, our buckle that was put on hold are still on hold. We had some, uh, one of their people had an issue with the COVID. So that was placed on a two week hold from our last court. That's not been uh, resolved yet. The, um, uh, maintenance department is out today working on an issue at the uh, at the Angel Road and Possum Kingdom intersection. So please just give those guys room to work and do their job over there, and we appreciate that. The Bogey Mill uh, Bridge uh, is still uh, scheduled for uh, demolition on the first week of August, with the replacement on August the 10th. That's still on schedule. And uh, also, um, you may see um, uh, contractors in the next week or so uh, doing some sealing uh, out on Goggins Lane, and we're also going to do striping out there. This sealant, uh, they go through, they fill the cracks, and you'll see that all over the roads. And uh, there's uh, several places where that the state has done this, but it extends the life of that, of that road about four or five years. 
So that's a good project. It's not, um, you know, we've talked about this. You're looking at maybe $400,000 to do a total blacktop over there on the Goggins Lane. This will buy us a little time to uh, set some money aside, uh, hopefully, and save that road some. Um, we have also uh, just ask you to please, just as we look around and drive around, and uh, I, this comment was made to me also, there's a lot of trash on roads and things like that. And, so, you know, just please, you know, keep your trash in your cars if you're going to toss it out. If you see it, if you have time, stop and pick some up. We'd certainly appreciate that. And uh, that's all I've got, Judge. If anybody reached me, they need, can get a hold of me at 200-9765. Thank you, Tom. John. Judge, thank you. Uh, Tom covered an uh, array of topics there, and I think you covered a lot of things I wanted to discuss, too, that the State Road Department, I've, I've called them, and, and they contract their mowing out. and have a couple of calls on College Hill Road. Uh, hopefully, it'll get mowed this week. Uh, the state is kind of like they do on the, the grading and the snow removal. They do the, the major roads first and work their way down to the secondary roads. So just be patient. Uh, Brandon promised me they were working as hard as they could to get to our uh, local uh, state roads. And so uh, look look for that to be happening. Be cautious as you pass those mowers. Uh, I've been working with Willie and the road department out on Griggs Road, and and there's a slide out there. It looks like we're almost completed the project out there, and hopefully going to get some good results from deterring the water uh, from running under the road and channeling it down the ditch line to uh, divert it to the other side. So uh, hopefully get some results out there. We, we've been soft and dry that uh, we're not going to be able to tell much for a while, but we, we will when the rainy season starts again. Uh, also, uh, Willie and, and of course you, Judge, and some others have. We've been discussing the, the subdivision with the cul-de-sac, and and we're working on that to, to see what we need to do about that. Uh, just thank all the department heads and and all the uh, staff for what they're doing, and uh, just continue to be patient and and. Uh, Hopefully this COVID-19 won't last too much longer. We, we can get through it and get back to some normalcy. Uh, we, all, we all miss getting out and seeing each other and being together. So stay safe, and that's all I've got, Judge. Thank you, John. Appreciate the update. Roger, hit your mute button, Roger. There you go. Got me? Yeah. Yes, sir. I just want to thank all the uh, – uh, county workers uh, were uh, still doing their job in the usual unusual times that we're in. Uh, I know it's a little different for them, and they probably get some complaints. But, uh, uh, the ones I've been around, they still go, they still go right ahead and do their job and, and uh, deal with the best they can. And I appreciate them. Uh, only question I got is, have you heard anything about the Maple Grove Bridge as far as that joins Tate's Creek? Have you heard anything from the state? I have not, Roger. I'm I'm actually uh, in contact with them. I've requested it again, uh, so I'm I am I am working on it um, and uh, working at, obviously with our state legislators as well. Try to help. I've just had two or three ask me about it from time to time, and I just tell them what I can or try to get a get a answer for them. But I know there's not an answer there. That's all I got, Judge. Thanks, Roger. Larry, uh, Larry, hit your mute button real quick. There you Better? go. Got gotcha. you. Judge, you mentioned the farmer's market there a while ago on Saturdays. They also have that on Tuesdays also. So today they're having it. I think it starts at 11 o'clock on Tuesday. But I appreciate you mentioning that. They've had some really good crowds there. I know I was up there last Saturday and it seemed like everybody had a mask on. So that was encouraging. But other than that, I don't have anything, Judge. I'm just glad to be here. Glad you're here too, buddy. Uh, Jenny, do you have anything to add today? You good? It's Kenny Barger. Sheriff? I just want, if Jenny's going to be in her office, I'm going to drop her. Okay. All right. Sheriff's going to drop you something off, Jenny. Needs to drop you something off. Uh, I'm going to call on our jailer, Steve Tussie, next, just to give us a little update on our home incarceration program. Uh, Master Bakken had reached out to me, uh, seeing if he could give an update. 
uh, I think Steve, you sent out a report maybe a week or so ago to all of us, um, just updating us, and we thought it'd be good for you just to present today to us. So thank you. You bet. Be glad to, Judge. Thanks for having me. Uh, just want to give a, a quick brief update on the home incarceration program. Um, we we have just completed our first year of managing that under the jail supervision. And I just want to run through the numbers real quick. Our expenditures for the program have been uh, just over $150,000. Well, fees collected, we've collected a little over $40,000. That's leaving us a total cost to run the program of 112000 And the savings to the jail, of course, of, of not having these individuals in jail and in custody has saved the county um, approximately $580,000. And then we take the expenditure from that. So basically, we've had a savings to the county of $473,000 for the program. Currently, we've got 66 people on this program. It allows the judges a, um, a, um, to, to add that as a condition of bond release, and it keeps these people from... Um, we're currently at 66 people. That program is slowly growing, and um, as it grows, of course, the savings to the county will be greater. Uh, currently, with their 66 people on the program, we're on target right now to save somewhere between 550 to 600,000 in this coming year. Just a quick brief update on the program. It's, it's working really well. Uh, we've got two people assigned to that full time, and then uh, some of the jail staff, uh, of course, supplement that through uh, um, financial planning and other things. That's all I've got, just a quick brief. Update on the program. I'm sorry. Appreciate you, Steve. You're, you're I was muted. I was, yeah. There you go. Yeah, thank you very much for the update. Hey, uh, Judge. Sure. Tom? Uh, his, uh, uh, at least on my end, the, the voice was just a little bit broken up, but. Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to reemphasize one of the things that you said there long toward the end was that, you know, this this year or the, this past year in the 19 and 20 uh, fiscal years, you know, that was a $473,000 savings to Madison County. And uh, from that home incarceration program, we sure uh, appreciate you running that, Steve, and taking that over and that's uh, doing a great job. We appreciate the savings there. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Steve. Uh, department heads. Do we have any department heads today that needs to address the court? All right, I don't see any faces popping up, so I'm assuming that's a no. Um, next, we have pay the claims and approve the transfers. I need a motion and a second to do so. Do we have any? Oh, uh, hold on a minute, Roger. I'm sorry. Uh, what is it? Um, so, uh, Willie, are you on still? Uh, we do have a comment uh, from the audience, uh, and it's on the Bogey Mill Bridge Project. Uh, and I know that bridge has been ordered, uh, and I believe we have a date of August the 10th, maybe. Is that correct, Willie? That that yes, bridge will be set? Yes, sir. It's to be delivered on the 10th. Delivered on the 10th, okay. Delivered on the 10th and start setting it on the 10th. Yes. Sir. Okay. All right. August, August the 10th. Roadside mowing. Uh, roadside mowing. I think we've addressed that. I, uh, Willie, will you update us uh, on our county roadside mowing? Um, I, I, I know we kept up with ours. Uh, we, we didn't postpone any of our roadside mowing. Uh, the the state, I know, due to COVID, they pushed back their mowing schedule this year and actually did it a little different way. We, we've been continuously mowing, but a lot of days we take those uh, personnel that's doing the mowing, we'll have to fill in in another spot. So we've not actually been mowing every day. Mm -hmm. but uh, And we're uh, getting to the point where we're going to have to uh, go around again and get all the mowers back on and get, to, get it mowed. 
get all the roads mowed off one more time. But that's uh, but we where we're restricted with personnel, we take those mowers off where we need them to fill in other places. But we don't have any roadways that um, really have tall Johnson grass that's laying over in the roadway or anything, correct? We've already made a pass this year. Yes, everything's been mowed at least one time, and a lot yes. of them been mowed two and three times. No, right. I'm not aware of I'm not aware of any problem areas. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that all the comments from the audience? All right. Good. Thank you, uh, audience, who, whoever they were. Thank you for your comments and being engaged uh, in county government. I love it. Um, next is uh, we'll go back and start all over, Roger, about a motion to pay the claims and approve the transfers. So, Roger Barger. John Tudor. I second that. So I have a first by Roger and a second by John. Thank you all. Is there any discussion about our claims and transfers? Seeing none, call the roll. Mr. Berger. Mr. Tudor. Yes. Mr. Bakken. Yes. Mr. Combs. Yes. Mr. Taylor. Yes. Uh, our next meeting is August the 11th. I want you to look, Chris. That was right there on my paper, and I had you look it up a minute ago. Uh, next meeting is August the 11th, 2020, is our next fiscal court meeting. It'll be uh, 9.30 right back here on Zoom. Uh, again, that's August the 11th, 2020 at 9.30 right back here on Zoom. Uh, I need a motion and a second to adjourn. Tom? So move, Judge. Roger? Second. All right. Call the roll, please. Master Tudor? Yes. Master Bakken? Yes. Master Combs? Yes. Master Carter? Just Taylor? Yes. Hey, I really appreciate everybody more than you know. Everybody have a wonderful week and God bless. Bye bye. Thank you, Judge.